So my name's Pete. Um, I was at Facebook for a long time, uh, and I was on the original React team. Uh, so we open sourced this JavaScript library called React uh, a couple years ago. And um, that was one of the main things I worked on at Facebook. Um, I also worked on photos and videos and Instagram as well. So I did a lot of, a lot of different products there. Uh, I'm currently uh, at my own startup called Smite. We're an anti-fraud API for social networks, marketplaces, and enterprises. So um, I'm living much more in the back-end data infrastructure world now. And I'm seeing a lot of parallels between the stuff that we discovered um, when we worked on React and the stuff that we're working on now when we're building data pipelines. So this phrase um, is uttered a lot, it's that software is eating the world and that software is such a big deal. But if you're in the B2C space, um, mobile is really what's eating the world. So I joined Facebook in 2011, and right around that time, Zuck decided that native mobile was going to be a big deal and going to be a priority. So I watched a bunch of full stack engineers that were working you know, anywhere between the CSS that rendered Facebook.com all the way to the back end where they're talking to, to the MySQL databases. And I watched them start to specialize and, and really work only on iOS or Android um, or uh, really start to specialize on web front end. And I started to feel like I didn't have enough team members anymore. They were getting pulled away from my projects. I was working way too hard and um, couldn't really meet a lot of the, the ambitious goals that we had set. Now, it turns out that that was the right call, and native mobile became a really big deal. But it just sucked that we had to specialize people into these different roles, and that we, we had to basically choose one platform or the other. But there's got to be a reason that that was worth it. And Facebook has uh, famously been quoted, or Zuck has been, been famously quoted about HTML5 a bunch of times. But really, it boils down to the user experience. So, if you're competing on the user experience, there's nothing better than native mobile when it comes to touch devices. Now, if you talk to some people that have built successful mobile web applications, they do exist, but they're generally not competing on the user experience. So if you have an online store that's selling products that everybody wants, your user experience merely has to be like okay, and people will still want to go get the product. But if you're trying to build the next messenger application or something that users really kind of need to love to be successful, um, Native mobile is the only way to go. And if you disagree, I'm really curious where the hit uh, web, mobile web app is that competes on user experience, because I haven't seen one yet. And so there's a lot of technical reasons why mobile web doesn't um, give you a great user experience. And here's a couple that I highlighted. So the first one is garbage collection pauses in JavaScript. So one of the things that distinguishes mobile web from the desktop is how we interact with it. So on a, on a mobile device, we're constantly touching the screen, and things are animating in response to how we're touching the screen. Um, go look at any app, and you'll see animations, photos flying around. You can catch it halfway um, as the animation is, is moving. And so CSS animations don't get us that far. You can't really interact with a CSS animation. You have to do it in JavaScript if you want to build these user experiences. And so if the JavaScript garbage collection uh, or garbage collector kicks in, it's going to pause that animation, and your app is going to feel janky, and it's going to feel slow. And there have been lots of studies that um, kind of quantify this impact on you know, the perception of the app and engagement and your brand. And it just, it's very hard to build smooth animations with a garbage collector. Another problem with mobile web is layout performance. So when you want to draw those boxes on the screen, it actually takes a non-trivial amount of time to, to compute all the constraints and position things correctly. And more importantly, it's difficult to understand how long that's going to take. So if you, you can stay on the fast path in the browser layout engine, and you can only use Translate 3D, and it'll be relatively um, highly performing. But if you, know, you hire a new person, they're not super familiar with all the nuances of a browser, and they call dot offset height on a DOM node, well, you suddenly just blocked all of your animations on the page that are using JavaScript, and you're screwed. Um, one of the, the scariest parts about developing a mobile web, though, is that it's very hard for you to feel like a native application. Um, you have to re-implement all of the native components in, you know, it, with web technologies. And so Google and Apple have teams of really talented engineers building these UI components um, for their native platforms. And then as a web developer, you're expected to redo all of their work. It's very, very difficult to get that right 
there are entire companies formed around trying to get this right. Um, I think Ionic is one of them. They're trying to, to build an experience that's really compelling on web. So I was a big mobile web zealot for a long time at Facebook, and I wanted to prove um, these points wrong. So I wanted to build the Instagram main feed um, with web technologies. Uh, have you guys used Instagram before? You guys familiar with how it works? So there's a main feed with a bunch of photos, and there's sticky headers. So as you're scrolling through, you see the, the person who uploaded the photo and their avatar stuck to the top of the page. And as, as a new one scrolls in, it pushes the old one out. Now that's something called a UI table view on iOS, and it's a standard component that Apple created. And so if I wanted to build this on web technologies, I'm gonna just tell you the story of how I, how I went about doing this. So first of all, you don't have that component in web technologies, so I had to build it. And since um, you, know, you can't get scroll events fast enough on mobile web, we had to re-implement scrolling. And that means interpreting every single touch event, every frame, then projecting the amount of inertia that we need to give the scroll area, and then animating it with JavaScript using Translate 3D, and if they catch the scroll area, we have to stop it. So we had to implement an animation engine and a physics engine just to get a scroll area where we get the scroll events fast enough. Now fortunately, there's one called Zynga Scroller, which is open source, and they reverse engineered iOS 4's um, physics constants, and it's, it's pretty decent. So just with that, the scrolling was, jank, was more janky than native because there were garbage collection pauses, but we were able to get those scroll events fast enough and build this sticky header component. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna drop images into this feed. And what I found was when I just put image tags into this scrollable area, as they were loading in, even with fixed dimensions, um, the scrolling was, was getting really janky, and actually the browser would miss touch events which means it would appear that my thumb would go from this position on the screen all the way up um, instantaneously to the top of the screen, and so the inertia would just fly. Um, and it was a terrible user experience. <clears throat> and so what was happening was the JPEGs were being decoded on the main thread, and it was blocking out the JavaScript. So once they were decoded and cached, um, the performance got better. <clears throat> but as soon as you got to the bottom of the page and you loaded in more photos, you were screwed, and the user experience was terrible. So, at that point, it seems like you know, you're, you're pretty much out of luck. But we wanted to push it even farther. So we took the JPEG.js project that Mozilla built, which is an uh, in JavaScript JPEG decoder. We ported it to work on a web worker, which is, an off, which is a secondary thread in the browser. And we had JavaScript do the JPEG decoding off thread, which didn't block the animations, which was pretty awesome. But then as we painted it onto the canvas, because you have to paint it with a canvas, that took too long, and that blocked the main thread. So then what we had to do was we implemented a priority scheduler similar to the one found in the Linux kernel, where we said, hey, animations are top priority, and they block out everything else. And then we prioritize painting images in the viewport, and then we prioritize painting images outside of the viewport. And at this point, we finally had pretty close to 60 frames per second scrolling um, and implemented the, the Instagram main feed. Now the problem is, after you know, doing that scheduling and decoding the JPEG in a web worker, it took us about four seconds to paint a single JPEG, and it would like, slide in like this. I don't know if anybody remembers using the internet in like 1994, <laughs> but it was like that. And so I thought, oh man, I could do like interlaced mode, and then I was just like, all right, I'm, I'm done. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is too much. So that's my really bad mobile web war story when I tried to actually get a AAA experience. And so I don't think it, it can be done, at least with the web technologies we have right now. The other main reason that people use native apps is um, features. So Flipkart is the number one e-commerce website in India, and they recently canceled their mobile web experience. Um, that's pretty scary because I don't think that they're even competing on their mobile web experience. But my hunch is that they wanted to get the push notification permission from their users um, so that they can basically get higher engagement rates and higher sales. And just having access to all these features on the device um, is a huge deal. All right, so mobile web is terrible and native is awesome, right? Um, native development sucks in its own ways as well. So on the web, we're really used to being able to push updates whenever we want. Uh, on native, we have to go through the App Store. We have to take a week or two to get approved by Apple. Um, the Google Play Store is a lot better. There is the beta channel, um, but it's still not the same as the web. Um, you get very, very fine-grained control on the web. Not so much on native. You build the same application at least three times. You build a web experience, you build an iOS experience, you build an Android experience. 
If you're ambitious, you build a Windows Phone experience and a separate um, web and mobile web, or desktop web and mobile web experience. Um, and you're just building the same things over and over and over again. What's even worse than that is that not only are you building the same application over and over again, you're hiring for three different types of people. Because if you want to build on Android and on iOS, you need to use different programming languages, different um, paradigms for describing your application, different layout systems, different tooling. Everything is different. It's very hard to, to kind of bounce between projects. And finally, iteration speed is a lot slower on native. If you've ever built, um, it's especially pronounced on Android. It takes a long time to compile, and then the simulator has to boot up, and that takes a while, when you just want to move something a couple pixels. And then you go, if, you, if you're building a web, you open the Chrome Web Inspector, and you can just tweak CSS in real time. It's really, really nice. So Facebook identified one additional problem. At the time that they were looking at solving these problems, um, React was just starting to take off inside of the company. And building applications with React was so much fun on the web, they really wanted to get that experience and bring the paradigms and ideas that React had to native mobile development. So this is the problem set that kind of, um, at least I had identified when I was there, and they, they were looking at solving these problems. So remember this slide. We're going to come back to it. I mentioned React a couple of times now. I want to give you kind of a brief overview of, of where it is today and why it's interesting. And um, you may have heard of some of this stuff before, but it's important when we start talking about um, React Native to remember this stuff. So today, React is Facebook's number one GitHub project by number of stars. Um, and I looked yesterday, and it looks like React Native is actually number two. Um, Angular, Ember, and other uh, projects are changing their roadmaps based on what React has, has been doing. So in Angular 2, they've gotten rid of two-way data binding. This is the framework that put two-way data binding on the map. And they are rethinking some of their core ideas because React proved out some, some really interesting properties of building user interfaces. Ember is also getting server-side rendering and performance improvement based on the virtual DOM approach that React pioneered. So it's having really big community impact in the, the two years that it's been out. Facebook is also building all of its Objective-C code, um, or it has open source a library for building apps in Objective-C called Components that looks a lot like uh, React, except it's written in Objective-C. And it's, it's aimed at squarely at native developers. We're also seeing an explosion of compiled JavaScript languages, particularly functional ones. And because, of the, uh, because React is very friendly to functional programming, they're able to interface with the DOM in a very natural way. So even if they're not directly targeting React, they're targeting libraries and frameworks that have the same properties. And there's a giant list of companies that, are, that you've heard of that are using React now. So the project's grown a lot. But what is it? We call it a JavaScript library for building user interfaces, but I think more accurately, it's a JavaScript library for immediate mode user interfaces. This is what I mean by immediate mode. This is a very simple component where when you click on it, it increments a counter. There's not a single place in here where we go into the DOM and look for a node to update. We just have this single render method that specifies, hey, here's how I want my application to look at a a single point in time. It doesn't have to worry about transitioning from one state to the other state. We care about kind of changing our underlying data model with set state, but we don't actually look at the state of the user interface itself. That update code is pushed deep into React itself. Immediate mode user interface development is simpler because data changing over time is really hard to think about. If you think about the really tough bugs that you've tracked down when you're building applications, if you can just trace the flow of the function, it's usually pretty easy. But if you get to a variable that's set to a value you weren't expecting, you need to track down every place where you've written to that variable, identify those places where the mutable state or where the state mutation was wrong, and fix it. And it's just really difficult. So if we can reduce the amount of um, dealing with state transitions in our application, we can reduce the number of bugs that we have. So what React conceptually does is it re-renders the whole application on every update, just like a 90s web app. So if you built a server-side rendered application, you never worry about what happens when they go from this page to this page. You just render the page out based on what's in the database, and the previous state is entirely blown away. So that doesn't have a great reputation for performance, but it's really easy to understand, because there's no more updates. 
So the real question is, can we make this fast? Well, if we were to blow away every single DOM node in our application and re-render it, it'd be way too slow. Um, not only that, it would ruin the user experience. So if you're scrolled halfway down the page and we re-render every DOM node, you're gonna scroll right back up. If you were typing a comment, that'll be blown away. Um, and it'll take, you know, hundreds of milliseconds to do this at least. So React's kind of, the thing that people find really interesting about React is we built this technology called a virtual DOM to make this a lot faster. So going back to this example, this div that you see here is not a real DOM node. It's not, it's not anything that the browser understands. It's a very, very lightweight representation of a DOM node. So what this says is, hey React, I would like a div to appear with this click handler and this text value. And React handles creating that DOM node and managing that DOM node for you. So your code doesn't touch the DOM at all. Because remember, the DOM is slow. And the way that this works is that every time there's an update, so a, a user clicks something or there's a request that comes back from the server, that render method gets called again and it returns a new virtual DOM tree. We diff the new virtual DOM tree with the old virtual DOM tree and we figure out what DOM mutations have to happen. So if that div wasn't there before, the DOM mutation is create a new div. If there was a div that was already there, it only updates the text of that div. It's smart enough to figure out whether it should reuse a node or recreate a node. And it queues those operations in a buffer, and then it flushes that buffer to the DOM at a time that's appropriate. So with React, um, generally at the end of an event tick, it will flush those to the DOM. And you can actually control that with, um, with a couple of API calls. This strategy um, is pretty similar to how Doom 3 works. And this is um, how we kind of presented React uh, when we first unveiled it as why, it's perform why it has a high level of performance. So the way game engines work, or at least Doom 3 works, is a, a great blog post about this, by the way, um, is that you have the state of the world sitting around in some data structure, and then you have some code that implements the game logic for the game. So how players can move around, you know, how in enemies interact, the physics, all of that stuff. That game logic takes the game state and transforms it into something called the scene intermediate representation. So given the state of the world and the player's viewport, what do we need to draw? So this says draw a monster over here, draw a door over here that's in the open state. That scene intermediate representation gets passed to a backend which turns it into OpenGL operations that eventually go down to the graphics card and actually draw the game that you're playing. So React works in a similar way. We have your application state. You have React components that look at that application state and render virtual DOM elements. And then that virtual DOM gets passed to React, which is the back end of the system, and that turns it into manual, or imperative DOM operations that then get sent to the browser. And over the past two years, we've kind of figured out that this is generally the best set of performance trade-offs for most applications. When somebody has a performance problem with React, um, it's usually not very common that they can't solve it, and if they can't, they generally drop down to manual DOM manipulation. There's not really a better way um, from a performance perspective for synchronizing state in your JavaScript to, to the DOM that we've found. So that's a bunch of stuff about web, but I want to talk about React Native. And so this is taking the React JavaScript library that um, has been out for a couple of years and been in use at Facebook for a long time, and rather than driving the browser, it drives a native application. And the first platform that's available is iOS, but Android is coming later. I think this year. So you guys remember this slide, right? This is why, um, let's see what, what we can solve with React Native. So the first question is, is pushing updates, um, being at the mercy of, of the App Store. Technology doesn't really solve this problem, it's more of a political problem. So React Native is not going to solve this problem for you. Um, I don't think any technology will really solve this problem for you. So the next problem that we have is building the same application three times. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could write an application once and have it run on iOS, Android, and web identically? Well, that's going to be pretty difficult because if you want your application to feel like a native app, you have to design it like a native app. And if you're going to, and you have to design it within the constraints of iOS and Android and web. Otherwise, it's not going to feel natural to that platform. So if you're going to redesign your application for each platform, you're going to have to change some UI code as well. So this is a non-goal of React Native as well. 
However, hiring for three different skill sets, that's something that React Native is really, really good at. So the mantra of React has been learn once, write anywhere, as opposed to write once, run anywhere. What do I mean by this? Well, the component metaphor is cross-platform. So you build components in the same way on iOS, Android, and web as you do um, you know, in, in traditional React. Now, the components that you're actually rendering are platform-specific. So the navigator on iOS is going to be different than the navigator on Android, but you interact with that component in the same way, and you build components on top of it in the same way. Data fetching um, is also cross-platform. So React Native has shimmed um, XML HTTP request and HTML5 local storage on all the platforms. So if you have any data fetching code that you write just you know, interacting with XML HTTP request, you can port that across all the platforms. So you, you do kind of have a write once run anywhere when it comes to business logic. And uh, I think WebSockets are coming soon. Handling touch events is also cross-platform. So one of the things that is very different between the platforms is how you um, interpret touch events and how you respond to events. And React kind of has this normalized event system that is, is cross-platform. Tooling as well. It's just JavaScript, so whatever you use to write JavaScript, type checking, editors, packagers, um, it all applies to all the platforms. Most importantly, though, is, is layout. So if you do any front-end engineering, you know that we spend way too much time lining up boxes on the screen. Um, it's really sad. Um, and what I've found is that with a layout system, I've kind of got to get my head in the zone a little bit to really understand it. You know, you're looking at this Photoshop mock-up or you have this picture in your head what you want to do, and you have to turn it into these kind of constraints based on, you know, um, the platform you're doing. So the way that you lay things out in CSS is much different than the way you lay things out using iOS auto layout, for example. And so one of the, the things that takes people a really long time when jumping between flat platforms is learning the layout system. So Facebook open source this thing called CSS layout, which is a cross-platform implementation of a subset of Flexbox. So Flexbox is the, you know, like latest and greatest CSS layout system. And they basically ported it to iOS and Android and web um, for browsers that don't support it. So this means that you can be working on an Android project and jump over to, to an iOS project, and even though the components you're using might be a little different, the way that you align them and, and stack them on top of each other is the same. So it's, it's very easy to get up to speed. And because it's a standard, um, there's lots of documentation already available online. And the general philosophy of, um, of React and the React Native um, project can be kind of summed up by this design decision, which is Flexbox is great, let's use it. The DOM is not great, let's not use it. Picking the best technologies and trying to, to stay within, um, like trying to use standards, but um, where they just don't work, unfortunately you have to, to go around them. So React solves this problem. Um, you no longer have to hire iOS, Android, or web specialists for every application. It's probably good to have one or two around, though. Um, but kind of the charter of the project was increasing iteration speed and making the feedback loop faster. So the reason why they, they kicked off this project was developing on, on native just took too long, and they wanted to figure out a way to make it faster. So I'm going to try live coding to demonstrate this iteration speed. Um, we'll see if it works. I don't know. Hey, cool. All right, so I started um, a simple React Native application um, before uh, this talk. I basically ran the command line tool to create a blank project, and then I did a very small diff um, that added this avatar component. Can you guys see this okay? I think bigger would be good. A little bigger, you got it. Um, so I have this little avatar component. This is on every single social network. It's a, a person's name and their profile photo next to it. And so um, you know, we're building, we have a view, we have an image, and we have the text that has their name. This is, if you're familiar with React, this is all pretty vanilla stuff. 
And I removed the boilerplate from the example project, and I created a couple of avatars that I'm rendering, um, which you can see over here. And then I'm styling it with Flexbox here. This makes sense? All right, cool. So let's try to make this thing look decent. Right now it looks terrible. Now remember, one of the big problems with native development is this compile, reload the simulator, um, all of that stuff. So first, we'll enable live reloading. So what that does is every time I save a change, it will, um, it will automatically reload the app. And so first, things seem like a little um, cramped. If you guys have any like design ideas, let me know. Just shout them out. There we go. Like we, did you see that change there? I can remove it. And we're adding a margin to the right hand side of the photo. Um, I want this to be like bold. Cool. Um, maybe some spacing around these. I was spaced out. Um, actually, I think probably eight's better. And then, I don't know, maybe like a border. A. Yeah. There's, oh, you can't see it, but there's a line there. Uh, let's see. There, you guys can see that, right? I, I was going to build this like really nice looking thing, and now. <laughs> um, so this is cool. This is like in the web inspector in, in Chrome. You're just editing the style sheet, and it's, it's just appearing. It's pretty sweet. Um, and this is a lot of what people do when they're building applications. They're kind of playing around with, with CSS properties, and they're, they're squinting at it, and they're like, does this look okay? Um, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, this is 2015. Like, we need circular avatars, right? Um, uh, so I, I'm not sure if you can see this, but I've got this category thing going on in these components. So like, I'm a programmer, Justin Timberlake's a musician. Um, I should probably render that somewhere. So this isn't just limited to editing style sheets. This is actually rerunning your code um, in real time. So what I can do is I can render a new component. Or, whoops, yeah, So now we've got the category there. That looks pretty terrible. Um, so we'll probably, again, this is Flexbox. So we should create a new column here. Style equals style. And then. I'll just put this in here. Let's make it explicit. And then we should probably make that um, gray, maybe. That looks pretty cool. Um, and now, um, one of the, the other things I mentioned earlier is how touch events are handled and handling that consistently across platforms. And this is something that web apps actually get wrong all the time. Um, and I will demonstrate what I mean. Um, so what I want to do is I want to wrap this in a touchable opacity component. And I'm not sure if, if you pay attention on, um, on mobile apps, when you touch something and you move your finger off of it, the focus can shift from a scroll area to the button that's, um, or from a button to the scroll area, depending on, on that behavior. And re-implementing that on every platform 
um, is really hard. And it's one of these things that make web, getting that wrong makes web apps feel like web apps and makes native apps feel like native apps. And this is one of the things that those engineers at Facebook and Google have spent so much, or at um, Apple and Google, spend so much time working on. Um, so this implements that correctly. So like as I, as I roll off of it and roll onto it, it, changes, it passes the focus to the parent app from this component. And I can handle events on this just like in the web. So another thing that's pretty cool um, is we can use a debugger. This is a really important part of getting quick feedback um, as you develop a native app. Um, so if I enable debugging, it pops up Chrome. It actually runs inside of the Chrome de um, JavaScript debugger and also gives you access to the React tools. So this is the React um, web inspector that you use for the web. And you can see that I've, um, I've got my avatar components down here, and they're all available in the web inspector. That's pretty cool. Um, and when I tap something, we get the JavaScript debugger right here. It's like pretty damn powerful. This isn't just like some project that they threw over the, the um, like open source fence. It's something that people actually use and people complain about not having a deb debugger. Well, there's the debugger. Um, it's really cool. Um, anybody else have like uh, UI feedback they want? Anybody want to change the way this looks? Okay. Uh, all right, let's go back to styles. So iteration speed's pretty good on this thing. Um, if you have been developing with native apps, um, with like a traditional uh, Objective-C application, there would have been a lot of compiling there. And of course, if you're a React fan, it's the same React JavaScript library in native um, as it is on the web. So there's nothing, it's like literally the same code. So there's nothing to change there. Um, but if we're building native applications, performance is a big deal. Because the reason we're building native applications in the first place is because we're competing on user experience. And if the user experience is janky and slow, it's, it's not worth it. So none of this stuff matters, none of this great developer experience stuff matters unless there's like best in class performance. And so we are using JavaScript and there's kind of mixed news about JavaScript. JavaScript itself isn't actually that slow, at least when it comes to front end development. It's the raw execution speed of JavaScript isn't that bad. It's the unpredictability of the GC. So you never know when the garbage collector is gonna kick in. So your app will be fast for a while and then um, the garbage collector or an optimization pass will kick in and you'll get a pause and then you'll get that janky animation. Um, and so if you look at Swift, which is Apple's new language for developing iOS applications, they're still using automatic reference counting. I don't know why they made that decision, but my guess is that it's much more predictable than a traditional garbage collector because you don't have these garbage collection pauses. Um, so while we like JavaScript because everybody knows it and there's a lot of co compiled to JavaScript languages and it is relatively fast um, for you know, all the jitted languages out there um, and it doesn't require a compile step, we still need to work around this problem. So we put all of the JavaScript in a background thread and we try to take as much stuff off of the main thread as possible. So we're running JavaScript core in a background thread and the main thread is running a little Objective-C piece of code that's called React iOS and running all the other UI kit stuff. And the nuances of how this is put together are very important. Um, the first thing is that it's important that the main thread is always in control. So the JavaScript um, side of the world can't just go talk to the main thread whenever it wants. What happens is that the main thread, when it has some time um, and it's, it's sitting idle, it goes to, to the React thread and it says, hey, here's some events that have happened recently. Here are all the events that you've missed, so touches and all that stuff. Um, what do you want me to do? And in the, on the React side, it may have been doing some processing in the background and queued up some, some mutations 
Um, or it might respond to those events Im immediately. And then it will respond back with a series of, of view mutations rather than DOM mutations. And then the main thread will get around to executing those whenever it feels like it. So if the main thread decides, hey, it really needs to do a high priority animation, it can pause the JavaScript side and it can have that smooth 60 frames per second animation. Um, so the important thing here is that the background thread can never interrupt the main thread because every time they talk, you have to do a little bit of synchronization. And so this is what the architecture of React Native looks like. It's just like a game engine. And actually, Doom 3 was originally designed to run on two cores. It was designed to run the game logic, so the front end um, and, uh, and the rules of the game on, on a background thread. And it was designed to do the rendering on a main thread. So taking that scene intermediate representation, turning it into OpenGL and sending it to the graphics card was designed for the main thread. Now, they didn't actually ship that, but that was in the architecture. Now, this part of, of React Native runs on the background thread. And this part runs on the main thread. So React Native is actually just another plugin for React. And there have been lots of other plugins built for React already. Netflix has one that renders to their custom TV UI components. Flipboard built one for React, um, called React Canvas that does a little bit of layout and text drawing and images on the canvas. And there's 3G, 3JS bindings as well. Um, a lot of different rendering backends you can target. And so, but the thing is is that like React Native is not the first JavaScript system that can drive native views. There's a couple. There's Titanium, there's Native Script, um, Xamarin, um, you know, has the, the .NET platform targeting um, native applications. But these other systems assume the more traditional mutable model, which makes a lot of sense because this is the way that people are used to building applications over the, the past however many years. You know, create this view, set some properties on it, read some properties off of it, um, and then make a decision. Whereas with React, um, React was designed from the ground up to treat the DOM as this hostile, slow rendering engine. And so it actually, the applications that you end up building with React never interact with that, with the DOM directly. Or if they do, they do so um, through React's lifecycle hooks. And so because of that, that chatter across the bridge um, is greatly reduced in a React application. It's very hard to do that with a traditional system unless you have some sort of um, framework in place that enforces that. So effectively, unless these other systems want to change their APIs and limit the way that people build applications, they can't make the same optimizations that React Native can make. And this is why um, there's a custom bridge built in with React. You can buffer these operations coming from the JavaScript thread to the main thread. You can buffer the events coming from the main thread to the, the JavaScript thread. And the thing that makes all this work is separating reads from writes. So the virtual DOM is kind of built around that whole idea. Um, you read from the DOM in very particular lifecycle hooks and event handlers, and you write to the DOM in an entirely different way with this render method, and it's, it's declarative. You never actually imperatively write to the DOM. So separating reads from writes isn't a brand new idea. There's actually a semi-famous uh, pattern called CQRS which is command query responsibility separation. And what this says is that your write, the proper separation of concerns, um, or one proper separation of concerns, is separating your reads and your writes, and that they're very fundamentally different. And if you do that, you get a lot of great emergent properties about your application. So why are reads and writes so different? Well, to start with, reads are generally idempotent, um, and writes are generally side affecting. And because of this, reads are generally cacheable and writes generally aren't. And depending on what your application is, um, kind of zooming out from just like the front end for a second and just thinking generally, um, reads and writes often have very different latency requirements. So for a traditional social network, for example, writes can take seconds and that's fine if a photo doesn't show up in feed for a couple seconds. But reads have to be very, very quick. Whereas if you're building like a, a trading platform, you have this enormous volume of writes that you have to process very, very quickly, um, but generally you're not doing as many reads. Um, this can often mean the difference between not touching disk and touching disk, which can you know, change the, the error rate that you have for reads and writes. Um, and kind of the, the biggest difference is that there's 
in many applications, there's an order of magnitude more reads than writes, or an order of magnitude more writes than reads. So the abstractions for writing data probably shouldn't always be the same as reading data. If I want to think about an application I'm building, um, when a user performs an event, I don't really think about, oh, I want to update Elasticsearch, and then I want to write a row into MySQL, and then I want to upload a photo to S3. I just think about, hey, I've got this logical event that the user wants to upload a photo, um, and like, that's the mutation API that I want. And then when I start to think about the different types of queries I want to do, like I want to do a full text search, I want to download a JPEG efficiently, and I want to go look up all the tagged photos of a user, that's when I start to think about, okay, what, types of, what different types of like, physical writes do I need to do to satisfy these reads? So as a fun experiment, if you start writing your applications and you start treating writes as fire and forget and completely decoupled from reads, what this means is that when you write something, you don't get a return value and you don't get to see if it threw, threw an exception or not. Um, if you design your application in this way, so that you kind of return the response from a write by, by just going through that read path again, the problem of dirty reads goes away. So this is actually kind of what the problem with two-way data binding was, is that sometimes you're reading out of, um, out of date values. Um, and so you don't have a problem with dirty reads, where you're expecting a write to have gone through, but you're reading an old value. When you put this restriction on yourself, you can buffer the reads and you can buffer the writes and you can schedule them more effectively and the underlying system can be more flexible, which means there's a lot more op optimization opportunities and a lot more opportunities for more robust error handling. So if you think about it, whenever you do a write to something, if you wrap it in a try catch, you have to think about that error handling and, and that user experience at every place where you do the write. If you think about error handling where you do the read in the user interface, you're always thinking about error states and you never find yourself in a state where you, know, you pop up an alert and the, the UI gets inconsistent. So if you treat your writes as fire and forget, a lot of interesting properties pop out. And this is what React's one-way data flow is all about. You write data one way, you read it another way. At the end of the day, I think React Native um, is pretty cool and has some really good ideas. And it's actually ready for you to start playing with and it's designed to build AAA apps, not um, kind of stopgap apps until you build up a native team. So check it out, it's, it's really cool. Um, and I can take questions now. Thanks for having me. Good timing. So I was, I was a little confused about um, when you were doing the, the live uh, app reloading. Was that reloading of the native app or was that reloading something in like a remote Chrome thing? I was getting confused between the Chrome debugging and the... Uh. Sure. All right, so the way that React Native is architected, um, is that slide, you know, you, you've got the two threads, right? Um, what React iOS is on that thread is a very simple message passing server. And so um, what React iOS does is it sends events to this like remote JavaScript VM running on a different thread, and that remote JavaScript VM sends mutations back to the main thread. There is no reason why this has to be on the same device. So when you fire up the React debugger, um, it basically points at a Chrome, like a server running on your laptop. Um, that, or sorry, it points to the Chrome VM running on your laptop. So it's actually sending network traffic over to your, um, to your device. So that's why um, you get this full debugging because the JavaScript is actually running here and they just swap out the implementation of the bridge to be a WebSocket implementation instead of like a JavaScript core message passing interface. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, and then one other quick question. So, um, like, why can't, I mean, since your whole app is just a JavaScript file, why can't, you know, I mean, you, you said that, uh, or you had an X next to the ability to update your apps without going through the App Store. I mean, why can't you just, when your app starts up, check to see if there's a new version of your, uh, you know, React Native JavaScript? There's no technical reason why you can't do that. Um, Historically, the Apple App Store has forbidden that. In the, recent, in the most recent terms of service update, it's become a little less clear. But the, the whole point of the Apple app review process is that so like, crap doesn't get in their store. So if you think about it from that lens, like, I'm, never, I'm not sure if they're ever gonna really allow that. But yeah, I mean, like, when you're doing this live reloading, we're just sending a new JavaScript bundle to the, 
the client, yeah. I have, I have to ask his question again, I think, because I'm, I'm not totally sure. So the, the app uh, in the, um, uh, on your machine here, the one that's on the, the left-hand side of the screen, that is a native app and not a browser. That is not a browser. There's no, you can't render HTML in this thing. Okay, excellent. There is a web view component that you can drop in and render web views, but. Is there any um, interoperability between the native components and the React code that you're writing? So could I just like instantiate a native component through React code? Or vice versa, if I was to write some React, like say network code that I wanted to share across applications, sort of the way you might do like a Unity uh, mm -hmm. based library, could I use React to abstract that complexity and then write native code to utilize that? Sure, so there's, the question is how do you interact with um, existing native code? Um, there's kind of two ways you interact. The first is um, exposing a native view as a React component. And the second is like talking to a service that exists inside of native. And so it's all done via this, um, they call it the bridge. And if you search for RCT export, um, I don't think I can zoom that. Um, but let's look at RCT camera role manager. I would live code this, but I didn't practice it and I feel like I might waste everyone's time. Sorry, dude. Um, but this is how they implement like saving an image in, um, yeah, I'm trying. It's Objective-C, so it's hard to fit everything in there. Uh, maybe I can like, something like that. So you mark this thing as RCT export, and that's a macro that tells the Objective-C side, hey, um, assign a unique number to this method a unique, integer to, a unique integer to this method, register the name of the, of the manager class with the, the JavaScript side and map it to that integer. And then when you send it messages, you can send messages that target this um, object. So this object, or sorry, this method must take JSON serializable parameters, which generally isn't that hard to do. Um, you send integers and strings normally. And then it takes these two callbacks, a success callback and an error callback, which are just uh, blocks in Objective-C. And then you can call them back with, um, you know, again, serializable um, data. And then on the uh, Objective-C side, uh, it's probably like, it's, I think. I have to look at the documentation for exactly how to do it. Um, where? Hey, there's internet, cool. Um, if you go to, to native modules, it walks you through an example here. So you, you just add this category, um, the RCT bridge module. Um, you add this RCT export macro. Yeah, it's, it's called native modules, I was right. Um, and then it just exports it on this magic module called native modules by its name. And then you call it, and it, it takes a, uh, an optional callback if you want to return data to it, uh, which is documented here. Cool. So um, declarative, like, so expressing your UI declaratively is, is like way easier to reason about, this idea of everything updating every time there's a change, way easier to reason about but seems to be at odds with like animations or transitions that are bounded by time and inherently therefore stateful. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't seem to be a solved problem. I'm just wondering if that's being worked on, what are your thoughts on it, how React handles it, that kind of. Um, so yeah, the, the question is how do you do animation in React, basically? Because mm -hmm. React, is, React is all about single snapshots in time and, and animations are inherently stateful. Yeah, I, oh, that seems like a reasonable way to say it, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a lot to talk about there. The, the answer is that there's this guy, Cheng Lu, who's working on a lot of this stuff, and he's basically expressing, he's creating data structures that express um, kind of a, a function that changes over a period of time, and you put that into your state, and then they constantly re-render React over and over again. That is interesting. I don't, I don't think it's like a, a solved problem, because uh, a lot of times you want to actually have that animation happen on the native side because it's gonna be a lot faster. 
and how do you reconcile that with the, with the JavaScript side? So I'm, I'm giving you like kind of a non-answer here. Um, there's somebody working on it, but um, I wouldn't hold your breath. The progress, there was, one of the blockers though was um, if you're gonna build an animation system, you're often gonna wanna animate between layouts. And um, so one of the reasons why there wasn't any progress on this for a long time was because the browser layout engine was too slow and you couldn't animate it. Now that we have CSS layout, we can actually animate it and control when that layout happens. So I think that we're, we're gonna see more progress, but I don't have a great answer for you now. Cool, thanks. I have uh, another quick question if that's all right. Um, so you have React Native and you mentioned earlier there's now component kit, which is mm -hmm. you know, actual native object of C code. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how those two things relate. Uh, I know you're not at Facebook anymore and you can't speak for them, but what is the view of each you know, inside of Facebook in your opinion? Or are, is like React Native the way to build apps going forward for a company like Facebook or someone who might adopt the technology? Or is it, how do you decide between those two different approaches? Um, the question is, what's the relationship between Component Kit and um, React Native? I can't really speak for Facebook, um, but the amount of work required to kind of bridge like a whole new paradigm onto a native view toolkit in a way that is intended to be cross-platform and in a way that has to deal with this like, host like semi-hostile programming language that might pause on you at any time, there's like a lot more work that went, that went into React Native, I think, than into Components. So Components was kind of like, oh yeah, we really like this idea, we need to ship an app yesterday, like let's do it. Whereas React Native historically has been like more of a research project. Um, there are two apps, um, production apps in the App Store uh, with React Native, the Facebook Ads Manager app and the Facebook Groups app. Facebook Groups is like 50-50 Objective-C and React Native. Um, the Ads Manager app is 100% React Native. Um, I can't speak to like, like engineering prioritization moving forward. Um, there's a ton of momentum behind React though, or React Native though. Sure. Um, so in a, uh, a regular React app, if I'm using things like Lodash, um, are, am I able to still use those with React Native? Like am I still pulling in other JavaScript libraries to manipulate data? Um, or? The question is, um, What's the story with third-party libraries and, and React Native? Yeah, I mean, the answer is if they work like isomorphically, they will generally work in React. So if they reference document or window, they won't work. So if you bring in, I don't know if jQuery works isomorphically these days, but if you brought in like something that manipulated the DOM, it would break. But stuff that works in Node.js generally works. Um, as far as like the more, so Lodash definitely works. Uh, the more interesting libraries will talk to XML HTTP requests or go over the network. Um, I was able to get a lot of things that just use XML HTTP requests to work out of the box. So you can actually, like the packager understands NPM and we can NPM install, like yeah, we could just do it right now, you know, like NPM install Lodash. Might, oh cool, it's cache. Maybe I'm already using Lodash. And then, um, I don't know, we'll do like, uh, reload that. Oh. And then we go here. We should have like Lodash and Scope. Whoops. Uh, yeah, all right, whatever. But like, you can NPM install it. Um, WebSocket stuff doesn't work right now. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, how much of this development workflow is available when you're testing on a real device and not on a simulator? It's the same. You can do remote. You can do remote debugging on a device. Yeah. Uh, and the second one is, what's the automated test testing story? Um. The question is the automated testing story. Uh, I don't know. Um. Like. Facebook shipping production apps. Um, they weren't shipping those when I was there. And so th they don't ship them without unit tests. So outside of like the traditional JavaScript testing story, uh, I don't know. Anything else? Well, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>